Hello, everyone. My name is Bryn Boyce, Associate Artistic Director of Commonwealth Shakespeare Company. Thank you for joining us today for our final installment of Tempest Talks. This series has taken a peek inside our upcoming production of The Tempest. Today, we're chatting with John Douglas Thompson about his work, his relationship with CSC, and his role in The Tempest, Prospero. But first things first, should you need it, speech recognition captioning is being used for this talk. Just locate the CC option in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window, click it, and select show subtitles option to see those captions. If you're viewing this on a rebroadcast, hello to you too. And you should be seeing our open captioning now at the bottom of the screen. For our patrons who use audio description, and for those of you listening along, again, I am Bryn. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a white woman in my 40s. I have blondish, almost shoulder length hair with dark roots, and I'm wearing round glasses and a charcoal gray top. I'll have our guest self-describe when he enters the webinar. Before we start, I would like to take a moment to recognize the indigenous land on which we reside as an expression of appreciation, awareness, and gratitude. I am currently in Medford, Massachusetts, and John is staying in Boston on colonized land in the traditional tribal territory of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples. We would also like to acknowledge that the digital technology that we're using together today is not available in many indigenous communities. To learn more about CSE's work toward racial equity, including this process of land acknowledgement, please visit comshakes.org. Today's Tempest Talk program is free, but we hope that you'll consider a donation of $10 or any amount that's meaningful to you. To donate, visit comshakes.org donate. In these uncertain times, your support of the arts is more important than ever. So CSC is best known for its annual free Shakespeare on the Boston Common. We are putting together an unforgettable production of The Tempest to share with you this year, directed by Steve Mailer and featuring our guest tonight, John Douglas Thompson as Prospero. John has been hailed by the New York Times as one of the most compelling classical acting stage actors of his generation. And the New Yorker says he's quote, regarded by some as the best classical actor in America. John most recently appeared on Broadway in King Lear, and the revival of Carousel. He also starred in Huntington's Man in the Ring, for which he won the Elliot Norton Award for Outstanding Actor. He also received rave reviews for his performance in August Wilson's Jitney, for which he received a Tony Award nomination. And last but not least, he's in my favorite new show, HBO's Mayor of Easttown, where he plays Kate Winslet's awesome boss, Chief Carter. And we have him here this summer, I'm so excited. So without further ado, John, come on in. Hey. Hello. Hey, how you doing, Brent? <laughs> Great. Um, hello, everybody. I'm John Douglas Thompson. I am an African-American male with uh, graying hair and a graying beard. Uh, I have on a black shirt, a black Levi denim shirt and a white t-shirt. Um, and I go by he, him, I guess, yeah, he, him, and me. <laughs> Fantastic. Those are my pronouns. <laughs> I love it. I, I have to start by noting that you have worked with Steve and CSC before, correct? Oh, yeah. Um, I like to say I was part of the inaugural outdoor production. I think it might have been CSC's second production that year, but it was, I think it was their first outdoor one, mm -hmm. which was Romeo and Juliet. And I played uh, Benvolio in that production on Boston Common. And I also did a show that Steve assistant directed at the ART because I was a company member there. He assistant directed, I believe, Henry V. And I played one of the French in, in that production. Uh, so I've known Steve. Now that goes back. That inaugural production is what, 27 years ago? The, um, 25, well, this is our 25th year. I think they did one at Copley Square. And then the next year they moved to the Commons. So that would have been 97. Did, did oh, that sound I, right? I, so. Yeah, I was 12. <laughs> you, were 12 you were 12 years old. It was great. <laughs> yeah, I've been growing up, with, growing up with Shakespeare. Growing up with Shakespeare. <laughs> I love that. Well, uh, I want the, that leads me to uh, my first question. I want to talk mainly about two things today. Um, mm -hmm. How you came to acting and obviously Prospero. Oh. So, but first, can you tell us um, about oh. your early years and your path to becoming yeah. an actor? Well, you know, this New England is is very much has been 
my backyard for most of my adult life. I, after I got out of college, I went to a liberal arts school called Le Moyne College and I studied business marketing, economics. And when I graduated, I moved to Connecticut. Um, and when I was in Connecticut, uh, I was there for quite some time, but there was a particular time in my life, I'd met this young lady who was a med student at Yale Med. And we were friends, but I, I wanted to be a little bit more serious. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked her out on a date uh, and I didn't want to go to your normal thing for dates, like a movie or even out to dinner. Uh, I wanted to impress her. So I wanted to do something really culturally interesting so that she would think that I was really smart. This is a really, I know him, but like, I didn't know him like that kind of a yeah. thing. you know. <laughs> So I was like, oh, we'll go to a play. And, you know, obviously I had not been to a play at that time, but right at the, uh, I was living in downtown New Haven, which is where Yale Drama School is. Mm -hmm. They had a play going on called Joe Turner's Come and Gone by August Wilson. <laughs> the great writer, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I said, oh, I'll ask her to that. And, you know, and she probably won't know exactly what it is, but she'll be impressed by it, you know, and it'll be something new. And uh, she'll be impressed by me because it's a cultural <laughs> thing. I don't know. So um, the day came to go to the play. We were supposed to meet at the theater. I got to the theater. She didn't show up. And this is back in the days of, you know, regular rotary phones, you know, pay phones. So, you know, I'm dropping dimes and quarters and nickels into the pay phone, calling her dorm, but I never got an answer. So she stood me up, at least from what I understood at that moment. And I was going to go home because I was a little... I was upset, you know, like, oh, wow, why would she stood me up? You know what I mean? Maybe I should have asked her to a movie. I don't, you know, maybe I'm starting yeah. to think it was the wrong theater. Was, ah, foiled again, Batman. So I, 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 I went, but I, I decided to go to the play. I went to the play and I watched it myself. And I was, you know, I was godsmacked. I was moved. It was a profound experience to see uh, people who actually looked like me and reminded me of my own family, you know, my uncle, my sister, my mom, my father, my cousins, you know, and immediately I had a very, it, it had a very strong impact on me. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. So hence, you know, I left that theater riding on the high of this profound experience that I had watching the play but I knew I wasn't gonna be able to do something like that right away. Although I saw that play and said to myself, oh, I wanna be an actor. I wanna do what they're doing. Right. I wanna be moved like they're moving me. I wanna be able to do that. Um, but I was working for this Fortune 500 company and you know, eventually it, it wasn't as if I'd be able to go to the company and say, hey guys, I quit. I'm gonna be an actor. <laughs> Ultimately, that's what the company did to me. <laughs> They forced me to quit because it was, you know, they were trying to downsize. Okay. So they let a lot of people go. I got let go. And I said, you know, maybe now's the time with severance. I had enough severance pay and unemployment to last me about 18 months. I said, maybe now's the time to try this acting thing out. And so I did. And I, uh, I got into a couple of productions and I went to drama school, Trinity Rep in Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And then when I graduated, kind of made my way up to the Boston area. And that's kind of the production I did with Steve Mailer and CSC of Romeo and Juliet was probably my second professional production out of school. Wow. Wow. So that, that is an awesome long, story. Long story <laughs> sure. And if anybody wants to know about the woman, yeah. we still remain <laughs> friends. What happened was she had the wrong night. Oh, <laughs> I gave, I, either there was a miscommunication. Yeah. So, I mean, we, 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 I did certainly decided after that, okay, well, we'll just be friends kind of a thing because, you know, this big miscommunication happened. Maybe it was meant to be. So I was meant to see this play by myself. By yourself. Yeah. Like, Most honestly, <laughs> I'm like, As you had to do it. Preoccupied with someone else who's sitting next to me, how they're viewing the play, are they enjoying it? And, and if I was focused on that, I may not have been focused on the play, so I wouldn't have been moved. And so it, it all worked out, it all worked out. Uh, oh, meant to be, that's, that's an amazing, an amazing yes. story. Yes, yes. Well, okay, and so that, that leads me into today. Um, 
and into Prospero, you are, you're into the first few weeks of rehearsal for this show now. Yes. And then there's been this, this crazy year that we've all had. Um, and you've had a bit of time to sort of sit and simmer with this play and this character mm -hmm. because of the pandemic cancellation and the online reading that we did last summer. Yeah. So I'd love to know what you are, what you've been tapping into. What is this guy all about? What are his relationships like? Talk about him. Um, you know, I, I'm always impressed with Shakespeare in that uh, Shakespeare or the plays which Shakespeare has written uh, always tend to meet me where I'm at um, in my life. Uh, and what I mean by that is the ideas of the play can always contain the ideas that are actually stirring in my life at that time. There's some sort of kismet or, you know, I don't know what it is, but it seems to always um, sync up. So this last year for me, as it's been for many others, has been quite an upheaval in just our ways of being and the things that we think about. I, I tended to, you know, I was stuck in my apartment, as most people were in their homes, in a kind of quarantine, if you will. And also, uh, we're being inundated with news and information about what's happening in the world. And it's often making us quite depressed or anxiety ridden because you're starting to see because of this COVID situation, it really kind of laid so many things bare for us all as a society to see the inequities that existed. And I'm not just talking racial inequities, I'm gender inequity, you name it. it it's the COVID kind of pulled, pulled, pulled the lid off of the pot so we could see all the what's cooking, all the ingredients, and then realize this is not right. This doesn't seem to work, or this is not sustainable. This needs to change. So I, like maybe many, or maybe it was just me, kind of went through, you know, the anxiety of the time, the rage of the time, the frustration with the time, the depression of the time, um, the, the, the feeling of uh, being jaded, the pointlessness of everything, the the erosion of democracy, the erosion of facts and truth and all these things really started to eat at me during this, I wouldn't even call it self-imposed because we didn't have a choice. We all were in this kind of a quarantine. So that's kind of where my head was at. And I really started to think about the Tempest and think about Prospero in a situation where he was driven away from where he lived to quote unquote, a self-imposed quarantine. I mean, he was driven away and had to be on this island. And so the question really is, is like, what, what were those thoughts and his ideas and how much did they sync up with mine? Uh, as I started to think about humanity and say, wow, you know, we're really, humanity is really going off the cliff. We're not caring about each other. There's no openness. And I started to worry about my own humanity becoming coarse and harsh and judgmental and and all these things that made me not feel like myself. And I tend to think, I started to say, you know, Prospero is probably in that same place. Whatever happened to Prospero that, you know, in, 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 in what happened to usurp him and take his dukedom away, you know, with it, and he had to flee or they made him flee with his three-year-old daughter in his arms in a situation where they were hoping he wouldn't even survive. But by God's grace, he survived. And I think when he gets to this island, he's feeling the same way that uh, aspects of how I was feeling of like, I could sense my humanity being eroded by the problems and difficulties of the time with COVID, uh, racial upheaval, um, health issues. I mean, you name it, everything seemed to come to the surface. And I felt that I was becoming a darker person, you know? Mm -hmm. I was losing touch with my own humanity. And I think Prospero is kind of living in that sense. And it's been 12 years and he's, I think he's gotten more dark as he's become an inhabitant of this island. You know, he runs it, he's the Lord on it. He, he makes the other people or other spirits there subservient to his wants with Caliban, with Ariel and all the spirits. And it's not as if he's on that island doing great things for these entities that he finds. He's 
forcing them to do things that he wants them to do. So I think some of that comes from what happened to him in Millen. And I, like I said, I could, I could pair that with aspects of my own experience through this year of COVID, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started to come out of it. You know, I started to tap into my, my humanity by finding ways to be open, finding ways to be caring, concerned, supportive, even in times and ways, particularly in times when I didn't feel it. I knew that I couldn't allow my humanity just to, to go down that road, right? And I think we're all trying to figure out how we approach the new world that we're going to step back into out of this quarantine, if you will. What kind of people or person are we going to be? Are we gonna be better than what we were? Or are we going to let the things that really created havoc in our lives control our lives? And so I think that is a choice that Prospero has to make. So this idea of redemption and revenge um, are juxtaposed with love and, 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 and charity and um and happiness and joy and creating those things. So they're forces that are continually pulling at him because of his experience. So that's how for me, and I know this is rambling, but this that's how for me, the things that the pandemic was about are also what the play is about, you know? Yeah. Those ideas, the complexity in my life is also existing in the complexity with Prospero. He's not just some guy who ended up on an island with particular magical powers. I think he's been shaped by his negative experience that put him on this island. And I think he is trapped in that. Yeah. So you, you said something really interesting. Um, I talked to you um, a few days ago about, about his brother um, yeah. and the sort of equation of, of like the, this um, someone he, who he loved and trusted, his family did this to him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and recognizing that um, humanity can be duplicitous. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the brother relationship that you Yeah, have? the brother, I have a brother, Prospero's brother is called Antonio, and it is Antonio whom Prospero loves so much, and Prospero kind of asked his brother to help him run the government, if you will, while Prospero was doing a few other things, but it was out of love that he petitioned his brother to help. And his brother, because I'd like to think his brother loved Prospero as well, he said, yeah, he would do it. But what happened is uh, the brother Antonio um, had some kind of an evil nature in him and then wanted to take over the dukedom. And then the process of taking over the dukedom was to get rid of Prospero and Prospero's daughter and send them away. And the idea of that being done to you by someone that you love that much, I mean, you might expect it from a stranger, you might expect it from a competitor, someone you don't know who would come in and usurp you like that, but you just didn't expect it from blood. And so the idea of the duplicity of nature, that someone so close to you, someone that you love so much could have an all, ulterior motive such as to destroy you and your life and your offspring, which is his niece and not care about it, is just, I think it's really an unbelievable idea for Prospero to hold in his head, the duplicity of humanity. And I think he's still reeling from that um, because it was his brother um, and because he loved him so much. He says in the beginning of the play of all the world, of all the, I, I loved him as much as I love you, my daughter, Miranda. And for him to be this way, just kind of, I think, shook Prospero to the core. So uh, um, on that vein, what, what has it been like to be back in the room with people? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if like the greater world understands what it's like to be, yes. an, actor, to be an actor who works in, in a space with people very intimately and, and, yes. and, and then and now you're back. What, to, to just un unpack oh, that a little bit for us. <laughs> you know, it's really amazing. It's, and, you know, you kind of have to think like theater because we had been almost prohibited 
from performing and getting together uh, with audiences or with ourselves because of COVID is kind of like the last thing to come back online, if you will. All things have kind of come back. People are going back to work. People are doing this. People are doing that. But theater has been on hold in this kind of, uh, I'm not going to, like a no-fly zone or just like a looping pattern. We haven't been able to land and do our work, everything else has been able to function. So coming back and, and theater is very much a physical thing. It, people are in a room collaborating, creating something greater than themselves. And that can't be done virtually or on the phone. It needs to be done with the proximity and closeness of physical bodies and minds in a room together, working on something like Shakespeare or other great pieces of art and creating something greater than the, the collective self. And that just cannot be duplicated and cannot be done any other way but by getting together. And I think we, we, we all got together yesterday where we all got to see each other for the first time and read through the play. And it was a joyous experience because we'd all been deprived of this, this thing that we do for two years. Of, of speaking language to another person, you know, without a mask that's right next to you, communicating emotions, feelings uh, through the play itself and having what the play can manifest in us, active bodies, active participants to go on a journey. So it was really quite, quite beautiful. There wasn't any stumbling blocks. It wasn't like, oh, I can't do this. This is it, it, it was like mother's milk, you know, we just, we were just able to tap right back in riding a bike. Okay, I get it. Yeah, this is what it feels like. And it feels great. And we're so happy to be here together. So it, that is such a present for us actors who've been deprived of the simple thing of getting together in a room with one another, because of the fear of COVID. Now, because we're all vaccinated, that fear is somewhat behind us and we can just, we can greet each other, we can hug. It, it, it's really amazing. And it's, and it's just the beginning uh, of, of the reconnection. Right, and out of, uh, of an abundance of caution, just so people know in our audience, um, the way that we've sort of staggered the weeks of this rehearsal is that the people with the the you know largest amount of lines met the first week, and then we yeah. added a whole mm -hmm. other group, and then we added a whole other group and a whole other group. Right. So literally yesterday, as right as of yeah. as this recording, uh, was the first time the full full cast got together. So just to yeah. sort of explain that to people that that um, e even just uh, our union is trying to keep us uh, keep us safe. And so we're just doing things in a different way. And so yesterday was your day. It's so, that's that's so right. wonderful. It's almost like I'm. there was this song about airports. I know this is really strange. And like <laughs> the emotions that happen to people at airports as they're waiting for their loved ones to come off of the plane mm -hmm. so they can greet them we're in that lobby or that waiting area, wherever it is. You know, because it's very different when you're dropping people off and watching the plane leave, because that's and that's what it was like when we couldn't work. It was like, OK, I don't know when I'm going to see you again. I love you and I hope that we can get back together again soon. So yesterday was like being at the airport and seeing your loved one <laughs> after a two year break. You know what oh. I mean? Like, hello. <laughs> and it, it was filled with all those kinds of of emotions, uh, yeah, and I never thought that, you know, I, who, 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 who could have thought that we'd be on a two year break? Who could have thought that we'd be suffering from a global pandemic, right? No one saw any of that coming. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's how it, it was quite a joyous occasion just to get together to do the work that we love to do, but to be together to do that work. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Well, um, since we, the last time we held a Tempest talk, I'll let you all know, registration for free tickets is actually open. You can register, this is wow. free, this is free. Just register for your tickets. Um, we are going to be in person this summer. John, as yes. you see, isn't it going to be an amazing Prospero? I um, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we will perform the Tempest in person, the temp, um, July 21st to August 8th on the Boston Common in front of a live audience of people. Um, 
John Douglas Thompson, thank you. It was so wonderful having you on Tempest Talks tonight for all our Prospero's World edition. Um, and as we wrap up, everyone, please don't forget to follow us on social media platforms to stay informed about our other upcoming events. Our handle is at ComShakes. Uh, we'll also be posting this recording on social media tomorrow afternoon for anyone who missed it. On behalf of CSC, I'm sending so many thanks to all who've joined us tonight and throughout the Tempest Talks. Please register for tickets now at comshakes.org and donate if you can to keep free Shakespeare on the Boston Common, a beloved summer tradition. Thank you so very, very much, Mr. John uh, Douglas Thompson. Awesome. It was a pleasure. Just a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Can't wait to see the show. Ah! Yeah, soon. <laughs> You'll be seeing it. <laughs> yes. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so all much. Right, bye-bye.